during the Q&A discussion session, all participants please use the chat box to deliver the questions. Thank you for your cooperation and consideration. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to guest lecture series on SDGs today, Tuesday, 30 March 2021. I am Asha from ITS Global Engagement, and I will be your Master of Ceremony this afternoon. Thank you for joining our guest lecture series on SDGs today. Before we start our agenda, let me inform you of some important information for today's event. First, please fill your attendance at bit.ly slash attendance underscores GLS SDGs. Our committee also sent the attendance link in the Zoom chat room. For participants who wish to get an e-certificate and stamp, please fill the attendance 15 minutes after the session starts. Second, participants who wish to ask questions during the questions and answers session, please send your questions to indip.in slash Q&A GLS SDGs. The link for asking question is sent to the chat room as well. Or you can ask directly by clicking the raise hand feature. Ladies and gentlemen, today's guest lectures bring the theme, quality education for all, critical and political perspectives, and the strengths and weaknesses of online connectivity, which will be delivered by our speakers, Dr. Miguel Antonio Lim from the University of Manchester and Dr. Arfan Fami from ITS. And today's lecture will be more moderated by Ms. Dewi Saktia Ardiantono, MT from ITS. Before we start our agenda, allow me to deliver our schedule today as follows. First, opening, second, introduction to the to moderator, third, lecture session, fourth, question and answer session, fifth, certificate awarding, and sixth, cl closing. Now, before we proceed to the next agenda, let me introduce our moderator. Ms. Dewi Saktia Ardiantono, STMT, is a junior lecturer at Department of Business Management, Faculty of Creative Design and Digital Business. Her academic and professional experience is she is a lecturer or researcher in the Department of Business Management, ITS. Her educational background are she is a Master of Industrial Engineering in ITS and Bachelor of Industrial Engineering in ITS. Her research interests are operations management, logistics management, and financial accounting. Now, without further ado, let's proceed to the main event. To the moderator, Ms. Dewi, the time is yours. Okay, thank you very much. So can everyone uh, hear me clearly? Yeah, perfect, Ms. Dewi. Okay, thank you very much. It's my honor to be the moderator for today's sessions for Dr. Lim and Dr. Arfan here. So please allow me to introduce our first speaker. So we have two great speakers here. The first one is Dr. Miguel Antonio Lim, and then the second one is Dr. Arfan Fahmi. So uh, Dr. Lim is a senior lecturer in the Education and Impact uh, Coordinator at the Manchester U Institute of Education at the University of Manchester. And he is also the co convener of the Higher Education Research Network at the Manchester. And currently, his research interests are on the internationals of higher education of East Asia and transnational higher education, university rankings, and also the performance metrics. Well, ladies and gentlemen, so based on the uh, topic of our today's sessions, which is about the sustainable, sustainable development goals, which is we are going to talk about the goals number four, which is the quality of education. So I come up with several questions. So if we are going, going to discuss about education. So actually, what pop up in your mind if once you heard about the quality of education? Why do we need this kind of education? And do you think does everyone have an edu equal education all over the world? So 
uh, in this uh, in the first sessions of a uh, guest lecture series on sustainable development goals today we are going to listen some insight from our uh, first speakers dr limbs so entitled the quality education for all a critical and political perspective so here we would like to uh, listen from uh, dr lim inside uh, about the quality of education, does it equal from one place to another place and from one generation to other generations? So we can uh, have a better understanding about it. So uh, without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Lim. Hello, Dr. Thank Lim, you. how are you? Good morning from Manchester or good Hello. afternoon to, to you all. Yes, uh, I'm fine, morning. thank you. And thank you so much for the generous introduction. Okay, Dr. Liam, the time is yours. Thank you again. So if I can share my screen. Um, right, I hope that uh, works now. Yes, it's coming. Right, so um, I just wanted to thank uh, you again, Dewi, for the introduction, Arani for the coordination, and everyone at the um, uh, ITS team for precisely the invitation and organizing this event. So I was um, asked by my colleagues at the University of Manchester at their international office um, whether I'd be interested to speak at this event in Indonesia. So, um, and I said, well, uh, yes, I would. I would like to build more links between um, the UK uh, perhaps some of you may not have heard of the University of Manchester, but you may have heard of the um, of the football team, uh, Manchester United or Manchester City. So we, uh, they might be more famous actually than the university. But well, the university has a, well, this city has a great university, and um, in the UK we're trying to build more links with Southeast Asia. So I'm originally from the Philippines, which is why I um, precisely at a presentation today, I, wanted, I want you to know that I have been working for a very long time in this kind of field of education, especially in the field of higher education studies in university partnerships and higher education um, partnerships. So I used to work um, in Paris and in London. And while I was there, I was trying to build um, these links with um, Southeast Asia. So I have been to Indonesia a couple of times. I have never been to Surabaya, but uh, I think the closest that I got was Yogyakarta, where I was um, working with a couple of universities there, um, besides Jakarta, which I guess is a common place for, for people to start when they are setting up their international partnerships. But in any case, I'm really glad to be here and to speak a little bit about um, SDG4, this um, Sustainable Development Goal 4. Um, obviously, uh, as, as you may know, um, this is the um, sustainable development goal linked to education. And it can be, I suppose, encapsulated in, this, in, this, in these um, four words, quality education for all. Right. Is the screen changing? Yes. Sorry, do you see the, yes, do you so see the next the, slide? Sorry about, thank the you. Outline. Yes, so, so the outline for today is that we'll, we'll briefly introduce what SDG4 is, um, and then we'll go very briefly into the definitions of education, the actors who define education, and then really the, po the point of this, this lecture is really to think a little bit more about critical um, perspectives or critical reflections. What does that mean? So I guess the idea is that um, if you just wanted statistics about uh, SDG4. It's it's well. It's easier to get the statistics um, from the internet, you know, and and these statistics are being updated all the time. Um, the sustainable development goals are global goals, so there the database is constantly being updated um, with respect to when data comes in from different countries. Sometimes there's data missing, so sometimes the data is good, sometimes the data is bad. I will speak about the big trends, but I think um, more than just passing on information, which you can perhaps find easily on the internet, I think it's better for us to have a discussion uh, about really critical questions or critical reflections. In other words, questions that make us think about perhaps the purpose or really the ways in which the goals are defined and the ways in which they can affect 
education and the achievement of these, well, this term, quality education for all. And this has to do, I guess, with questions of, of power, like who gets to define what quality education is, as well as implementation, who gets to decide what kind of education is provided and what kind of education is supported with, um, with finances from governments or from private actors. So SDG4, so there are many, many sub parts or sub targets in SDG4, but the main, the main um, text is really to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and to promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. And the second part is very important. The idea of lifelong opportunities, because I guess the difference with SDG4 from the Millennium Development Goal in education is really the inclusion of um, tertiary and lifelong education. In other words, the previous um, development goal, the previous Millennium Development Goal, really focused on the expansion of basic education, so really education for all children. But now there's a sense that those um, enrollment rates have really increased. So more and more children go to school. There's still some children who don't go to school, unfortunately, um, in some parts of the world. And there are structural difficulties with respect to, for instance, gender dynamics or sometimes religious dynamics, which um, social religious dynamics, which prevent some people, some children from going to school. Of course, the biggest um, challenge is also poverty. But, um, well, in general, uh, uh, more children now go to school. So now the goal has really expanded to include lifelong education beyond the basic level and the question of quality. So this word quality here is very important. The idea is that it's not just uh, enough to have children in classrooms or people in classrooms, but they need to receive a education of high quality. And of course, there, there are lots of debates and arguments about what, what quality is. And unfortunately, we may not have enough time in our, in our short session today to go into all these debates. But if you want, we can discuss that in Q&A. So SDG4 is, as you know, one of 17 um, sustainable development goals, it's the one that is related really to education. But as you know, all of these goals are linked to each other. So what are really these um, some of these details of SDG4? So there is a lot of emphasis on, for instance, gender. So the um, uh, uh, really the emphasis is to try and to get more girls to school or that there's gender parity. Of course, this is true because in the world, there are still many girls who don't go to school. However, in some parts of the world, there are also um, some uh, evidence that sometimes it is boys who are um, lagging behind in school performance. So the point is that gender and other demographic characteristics are important things to consider with respect to providing education for everyone. I think the idea as well in these goals is okay to ensure all boys and girls complete free, equitable and quality education is the idea that it needs to be freely accessible. In other words, the idea is that, okay, if, if the world fulfills these goals, that education is provided for, for free. And as I said, this last bullet point here at the bottom is that now the, the goal has expanded to include women and men. So in a way, old people who are older than boys and girls um, to affordable and quality technical, vocational and tertiary education, including university. And this is a very important point. So this is the expansion of the goal to include high quality university education. I guess there is also the recognition here that the world is moving to a much more knowledge based um, footing or knowledge based foundation. Right. So again, it's about increasing youth and adults who have these relevant competencies and skills. And I also highlighted once again, this thing of the elimination of the disparities or inequality. So equality and equity are really core um, ideals of the of SDG4. So the idea that gender equalities or inequalities um, need to be need to be removed, as well as, of course, inequalities due to disabilities, people from ethnic minorities, and other um, persons who are in marginalized situations. So now to, to go to some of the more critical questions that, that um, I was talking about. So when we define education, really the questions are that what gets taught 
So in other words, whose knowledge counts or what kind of knowledge counts, right? Who has a say and who makes the rules? So earlier on, we said that people need to be provided with these technical skills. And so in many countries, there has been a strong emphasis, for example, on STEM subjects, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. For instance, uh, not just, well, obviously, this is true across the range of, of um across levels of education. So for instance, you have some institutions that really specialize in technology. And I noticed in the video that was playing before um, the our um, uh, seminar started that, for instance, ITS really focuses on technology. So that is not just true for ITS, but in many places, there's really an emphasis on STEM subjects. Now, I think that's very important. I think there's a recognition of the importance of that, especially with respect to economic development. But there is also a debate. We shouldn't forget that there are some people who say that an overemphasis on STEM subjects is also potentially, um, uh, it's an imbalance that may also affect society. So that is a that is an interesting question. What what kind of knowledge is being um, provided in in schools? And in other words, what kind of knowledge um, is uh, leads to a quote unquote quality education? Is it only high achievement in STEM subjects, or are we supposed to spend our educational resources to educate um, children as well as um, men and women in kind of other fields? Yeah. So I'm just bringing out a few quotes from in interesting people just to toggle our, our mind, especially with this term of definition. So Nelson Mandela said that education is the most powerful weapon we can use to change the world. So here, education is described as a weapon kind of to fight something evil. Here's another quote. I mean, it's a little bit small here, so I'm, I'm going to kind of blow it up here. This is, this is actually not from a famous person, but it's a quote from a high school student in India which was quoted in a UNICEF report. UNICEF is a large um, philanthropic organ, large international philanthropic organization. So here, the education is not described as a weapon, but as a form of magic, right? The closest thing to magic and nothing can transform a person's life in the way that education can. So the idea is that education changes the world, education changes life. So uh, I guess, <clears throat> You may have heard of these definitions before. And what I wanted to point out here is that um, most people, when they speak about education, they only have positive things to say about education. So in other words, education is it is never negative. It is always the solution. It is never the problem. And it and not just is it not the problem, education solves all problems. So this is this is as well kind of a policy response. I'm not saying that we uh, in this Zoom seminar believe that, but it can be a, a response of all policymakers. Oh, there is a problem with, uh, I don't know, poverty. The solution is more education. Oh, there is a problem with um, uh, terrorism or um, far right movements in, in the UK or lack of democracy in this other country or this or that. Oh, the solution is more education. Oh, the problem is that, you know, th this thing of COVID is a problem. So the, the solution is more education. So education is always the solution. And of course, we recognize and later on, we will see that there are these pathways in which education does lead to development and is a solution. But what I, the idea is when you think critically about something, you try and take a step back and think about, well, really SDG4, now that we have provided education for everyone uh, at a young age, and now we're planning to provide it for um, older people. It's interesting as well to think about this expansion of education and how it has also um, strange effects and that, you know, if we just think that education will solve everything, we may not realize that there are important decisions that need to be made in our choices about education that can have big effects. So there are these interesting studies that show, for instance, that for in <laughs> I, I remember one study that came out many years ago that, oh, it precisely just as a um, to counteract this idea that education is in fact the solution to all the problems, that 
people who engage in, for instance, acts of violence or terrorism. So this study came out after the attacks on 9-11 in the US that all of the um, people who were involved in that, in that action had very advanced degrees. And so in that case, higher levels of education were related to um, uh, extremism, right? Like, or susceptibility to extremism. Or right now, for instance, in the UK or the US and in some other countries, education is seen as something that is promoting inequality in society because higher education institutions, the ones who go to university are the ones who get the, the higher paying jobs. And so there are some people who criticize well, this system that education is leading to a more stratified society and leading to more inequality in society, even though the individuals who benefit from education, they, well, they earn more money. And so for them at an individual level, their lives are changed. So I don't, I, I, I don't say this to, to convince you that education is bad, but I just say that when we think about the sustainable development goals, which are presented as really something that will benefit the whole world, they are. it is good to reflect and to think, how can we implement and really um, work towards an intelligent and thoughtful way of promoting education and of promoting good education? Education, just like other things, can be a force for evil or, or you know, not so positive things, as well as, as good things, yeah? So the language of education is normal in, in education and development studies, sometimes has this, well, has historically had this north-south or rich and poor kind of binary. Um, and in fact, this is important when we think about whose knowledge in education is being transmitted, because definitions of education are rarely neutral. So my research, for example, is, a, well, one of my research lines is in university rankings. So you may have heard of some of these instruments, um, the Times Higher Education Rankings, or the um, um, QS Rankings, or the Shanghai Rankings. And here we might say that, oh, these, these instruments are ways to measure quality in education, which is what is um, what SDG4 is, is promoting. But my research shows that these definitions of quality are really very um, specific. So they reflect quality that is uh, developed in certain places or refers more to certain kinds of institutions. They refer to Western research-oriented and research-intensive um, institutions. That doesn't mean that they are bad, but it means that these rankings reflect that kind of quality and not other kinds of quality. And again, that makes us think about whose definition of quality is important when we talk about um, quality for all, quality education for all, right? Because there are knowledge hierarchies in the international space and in international education and development. So again, there are theorists who are trying to think about this, that there are perhaps many definitions of quality. While we might agree that more people should be educated and that everyone should have access to education, I guess what I'm trying to um, um, ask you to think about is really to think about this word quality, because that can be interpreted in different ways. And here's one person, Raywin Connell, um, who is uh, who wrote a book, Southern Theory, who just uh, basically asks us to think about where our our definitions of, of, of the world come from or where our perspectives of the world come from. And that there might be an Indonesian perspective of quality in education or higher education. There might be a Filipino or Southeast Asian perspective that might be different from the perspectives um, in other countries. Yeah. For instance, this is just uh, one of these critiques that is mentioned, right? Like that um, education is comes from many different places and that this image of the quote unquote white savior who comes and saves the uneducated people in the rest of the world, this is already an outdated image and that there are more and more um, understandings of, of knowledge and quality around the world than just this kind of image. And in fact, to go back to the UK, there's a recognition of this and some of these UK celebrities have stopped this kind of um, fundraising that that makes it appear that they are saving all of the people in in the other parts of the world, which is, I, in my opinion, uh, a good a good development.
Yes, and so again, you are hopefully seeing changes in some of these ways that education is represented, even visually in websites or in, um, for instance, this COVID, for instance, um, uh, ho well, hopefully, I hope COVID uh, has allowed these kinds of um, activities such that for people um, like um, your, your, your colleagues at ITS can share their ideas with the world. And it's not only that people have to go to certain places for knowledge or go to certain labs in um, traditionally developed countries where, okay, when we see this picture, we think, oh, okay, maybe the the you know the white person is the one who is in the you know like the developed laboratory so but now there is a hopefully a, a more democratized environment of education yeah and the next is that well the idea is that who defines the goals of education and going back to the um, uh, sustainable development goals again who defined this goal and of course, we know that this is a United Nations goal that was coordinated among by the United Nations with different countries. So in a way, it is representing the views of different countries. But also, too, it's also important to say that the UN and the SDGs are not the, the only actors in the definition of this goal. There are, in fact, corporations, there are national development agencies, and other actors that are seeking to define education. And that's perhaps the last point we will discuss. So I don't know if you thought about it or realized that, for instance, the platform that we are on, Zoom, or other technological organizations like Google, which has a platform, Google Classroom or Facebook or other organizations, that they also have a role. It might not be so um, transparent or evident, but they also have a role in defining what kinds of goals and what kinds of education and what kinds of quality education are being delivered. And as, as I mentioned earlier, this can include other organizations like ranking organizations as well. But in the case of the UN, which is the organization we're talking about now, we can only focus on one given the time. So uh, its definition, uh, well, its definition uh, of quality education for all is based on several of its own um, political uh, motives, and we will discuss that now. So it, the UN, um, as well as uh, its one of its bodies, UNESCO, which is the UN body for education, scientific and culture, uh, sci education, science and culture. So there are some definitions or some parts of its philosophy that are seen in this kind of definition of, of, of education. So education is presented as a human right, as a form of human capital, and as a means to economic development. So for instance, in the UN framework, education benefits individuals, but also wider communities, right? That's, well, for the individuals. But then there is also this economic perspective on education. And then there's a health perspective, health and prevents disease, which is why education is probably going to be seen as a solution to COVID. And then finally, there's also given that the UN is an international organization, that education is also seen as a solution for peace. In other words, education can help international relations improve. So there's no time to go into each of these discussions, but it's just to say that every organization, given its, its purpose and its goals, has an effect on how that organization will define education. So here's some definition of UNESCO, which is the UN's Education, Science, and Culture Organization. You can look this up um, on, your, on your own. Um, and obviously here is where, for instance, you see the basis of these um, ideas about education as a human right, as well as, for instance, as an economic good. We'll end on that. Finally, I want to end on this um, presentation of education. And then there is a very strong, I would say, uh, a uh, set of research or a set of actors who really uh, want to present education as a concrete solution for poverty. So of course, education is a different thing for different people. But one of the strongest, I would say, um, discourses or one of the strongest um, bodies of um, research and policy around education is really around its role um, to prevent 
poverty, not just to prevent, but to lift people out of poverty. So there are different ideas about how that's done. There are some classical papers in economics, as well as more recent papers that show this. So I'm just showing you some. This is uh, Mankiw, Romer, and Weil uh, from 1992, which is about human capital leading to higher levels of economic output. There's also um, education linked to innovation, which again leads to higher um, capacity in the economy. These are several studies, Lucas, Romer, Agion, and Hauvit, um, and more recent work by Ben Hamib and Spiegel. Um, this is about the transfusion and diffusion of knowledge. So in a way, it's linked to kind of current trends in information technology, which some of you might be studying at ITS. And again, that how this helps to expand, for instance, the economic productive capacity, so education for economic, um, economic development. So and that brings us to our last question is that, OK, what should be funded? So maybe if you uh, if you are the government minister and uh, people say that I only have so much money in my budget and someone tells you, well, spend it on education because education will solve the problems of poverty. So that's one way to think about education only as a solution for the economic development. As I said earlier, there can be more purposes in education. So if you choose economic development, even within this space of economic development, there can be several choices that you need to make. So should you fund primary, secondary, tertiary, or lifelong education? Should you fund it via the public or the private sector? So again, there's no time to discuss all of this. But just what I wanted you to know is that based on this definition or the framing or the economic model that you use, you can change your decision about what kind of education to fund. So I will just leave you with this idea because we've run out of time. We've gotten to 10 o'clock, sorry, 10 o'clock in the UK, um, which is uh, <laughs> probably four o'clock. Four, four, 4 p.m. <laughs> yes, exactly. So my, my last point here is that um, the, the economists at the World Bank at the time, just to give you this idea of the definitions, how they can be shaped by, by different actors. So they had a, quote unquote, man, uh, they had a different way of understanding what is the best kind of education to fund. And they used this model called the economic rates of return model. So you, may, you don't need to understand all of the details. But what I wanted to say was that this model said, on the basis of this model, it showed that uh, people must invest or governments must invest in primary education because primary education led to the greatest um, economic returns, to the greatest return on investment based on this economic model. Yeah, that is the main point. But um, what, so, um, so this is basically the, the model. Uh, th these are some of the economists that worked on that model. But then there was another, um, there was another model. The, the one that I wanted to, to say was that in, in recent times, what I mentioned was that SDG4 has expanded to include higher education. And that is because there is a new model being used at the World Bank now, which is called the manpower model. And in this model, specialization in the economy is important. So the idea is that not just do you need like basic education for everyone, but because in a knowledge economy, we need certain people to be the robotics engineers, just like what you are studying in ITS. And some people need to be the software engineers, and some people need to be the uh, you know, accountants, and some people need to be whatever, the, another kind of profession, the creative musicians. And this new model, this new economic model showed that, oh, the rates of return changed and that it is good to have more um, high uh, diversity in specialization in the economy. And on the basis of this shift in the economic model, a new kind of thinking emerged at the World Bank. And the World Bank said that now we must promote higher education as well, because that is how different countries can promote specialization in the different professions in their countries. And that is why different countries now have these initiatives to build world-class universities. And that is also why in SDG4 now, you have a um, inclusion 
of university education. So using this example and reflecting on what we've mentioned earlier, we've spoken a little bit about and we've thought a little bit about the ways in which education is defined and how education goals are defined. So even on such a big goal, such as the sustainable development goals, we've shown that education is not just one thing. It can mean different things. It can mean, um, you know, it can be seen as a drive for equity between boys and girls or men and women, or it can also be seen as a way of in improving, right, like economic development via specialization in higher education. But that is based on a different set of decision makers and a di different set of actors um, in all of these organizations that are trying to push for their ideas and using their tools and models and philosophies to enrich this definition of quality education for all. I'll end here and I'm happy to discuss things um, later on in questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Minkow, for the very insightful presentation. So actually, there are uh, several questions who already pop up in our link, but I will keep it later uh, in the question and answer sessions. So after this, we would like to have the second sessions of uh, our speakers. So please allow me to introduce uh, Dr. Arfan Fahmi. Hello, Dr. Arfan. Hello. Okay, Dr. Arfan is already here. So Dr. Arfan Fahmi has already pursued uh, his education so for a PhD and a master in a university, uh, in the State University of Malang in the English education. And he also finished his bachelor degree in University of Erlanga, Surabaya in the language and literature, English language and literature. And uh, for the time being, his expertise in especially in ESP, blended learning, learning motivations, and curriculum and instructions. And now Dr. Arfan also has uh, research collaborations with the University uh, Malaysia Perlis or UNIMAP Malaysia. So yes, uh, Dr. Arfan in this evening would like to talk about the strength and the weakness of online connectivity in hyper-flexible education. As we all know that uh, this pandemic has changed the system of our education, especially in Indonesia. So we would like to hear from Dr. Arfan about the strength or the weakness of this kind of thing. So Dr. Arfan, the time is yours. Thank you very much. <coughs> Hello everyone. Good afternoon. Good morning, um, Dr. Miguel Lim. It's very nice to see you all here in this occasion. I would like to say thank you for uh, giving me opportunity to share my opinion and ideas on strengths and weaknesses of online learning, especially in this era. I should call it hyper-flexible education. So we never imagined before the pandemic came that we are here in front of the screen, connect to each other, different continents across the globe to have one point meeting at a time to discuss the topic. I think this might be something unfamiliar in, 19, in 2019, right? Although some of the network has been grown up for this kind of platform, but then intensively we use that kind of platform after the pandemic. Let me share my... Right, in my slide, there is a new tagline of ITS. Although 
we are working on science and technology, but all those purposes is going back to advancing humanity. So humanity is the central point of ITS missions. Now, what is online connectivity? Like we have now having such a webinar for intensive and vision uh, meeting today. We can uh, see each other virtually without any barriers, despite of some of the connectivity maybe have a, a low bandwidth so that we have some problem in accessing internet. But then all of the things, although we can just say it on the screen and uh, without any, you know, things like um, feeling or a touch of emotion, but then we can feel by having this kind of um, media to improve our knowledge and also to raise our attitudes and values of our life. Hyperflexible education. I think any of you here now sitting nicely on a cafe, or maybe some of you are in your cozy room, or some of you get together with your friends in a living room or near the kitchen. Anyway, you can have such a very um, interesting talks where you can also take notes or you do something else. Uh, that might be the hyperflexible education. So we can do it anywhere, um, anytime in, in your own pace. Now, before I move to the next one, let me uh, play one video that it might be happen to you as a student. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this online class. Click present when I call your name. Uh, Jack? Okay. Peter? Okay. Present. Okay. Let's listen to that. So I know this is a bit unusual, but I really hope we can study well. I want us to gather to try to grab the knowledge from this class. I want us to. Why did you just you know black holes had particles that killed everything in the bang? The black killed everything. Bang. If you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand and and I will not see you. Uh, radon is accumulated experimentations and that such as the underground mine, maybe uh, build up the science spectrum Let me ask a question to Charles. It's the sixth noble gas. Answer by pressing the um, radon? Good. Next thing I want to add is... Someone appears to have forgotten to turn off his microphone. Last time I'm having Indian food. Charles, I can feel that you're not listening. Can't see? Uh, I, I am listening. Oh yeah? That's what I'm saying. Shit. It's all shit. Okay, I'm kicking you out. Get out. I don't want you in my class. Are you out? Yes. Doesn't sound like it, but luckily... I know that they got you. Yes. I can see that all the online was great. Uh, let's move on. Fundamental idea of science. Eloquently, with by none other than the Nobel Prize winning physicist uh, Richard Feynman. The theory that we understand is the Big Bang Theory, Gravitational Theory, Automatic Theory are all... I love this. Okay, class, before the lesson ends, if you have any questions, please now. Yeah, sir, I have a question regarding.
Unfortunately, many people in Indonesia come with a different angle of the crucial of education from young generations. They show that without having a higher education background, they still can be a boss or they still can be a rich people without the higher education. Since they have a great strategy on a business, so they can have a success. So what do you think about this perspective, Dr. Lim? Can you suggest uh, what should we do as a university student when uh, the surrounding is a, have a different point of view like that? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dewi. So can I, can I just clarify the question? So yes. uh, the question is about uh, how to react when in society people say that it is okay not to have a university degree because they can become a boss or become a successful professional. Yes, exactly. Yes. I, I don't think that's a wrong, <laughs> I don't think that's a wrong um, uh, per idea or perspective. And I, and I certainly think that the, op that opinion, the persons who have that opinion, that if it's possible to uh, have a good career without a university degree, if the society supports that, then that is okay. So the idea, again, that I wanted to stress is that education is um, very important. It has a lot of, uh, it brings a lot of good, including higher education. I think it is very important, but I think the context really matters a lot. So with respect to the context that your, uh, the person who asked the question with respect to that context, I think it is a very real context. And it doesn't mean that if you don't have a higher education degree, that you are less able to perform a professional task. So higher education helps to train some people for certain tasks, and it can be necessary for the ta those tasks, or it may not be needed. So for example, to give you a, a European example, uh, Germany, which has a very high level of technical skills in its, in its society and in its country, uh, many people do not go to university. They uh, obtain technical qualifications, but outside the university as apprentices at um, factories or at different businesses. Some of them decide to combine that with a university degree, but others just do their apprenticeship. So in that case, um, it's fine. They get a good job without a university degree. However, in the, U in the UK, where I am based, um, more than half the population uh, goes to university. And the, the economy is, uh, the very large part of the economy is in the service sector. And here there is kind of um, credential, you might say, requirement that people need to have a university degree to be able to enter the service economy. So here it is a little bit different. Here access to the labor market is via the university, especially in the service mm -hmm. sector. So here I would advise the person to really think very carefully about whether they should go, go to university or not. It's still possible to have a, you might say a, a well-paying job, but it is increasingly more difficult in the UK and in some countries without a university degree. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Lim. So when we are uh, surrounded by uh, some, some people that think maybe education is not important, so maybe we have to think more in the future because the education itself will help us uh, to train our uh, level of understanding about, about anything. So it will be great if we still consider about the higher education. Okay, Dr. Sorry, Lim. That, on, so, on that note, I just wanted to... I just wanted to add that, that you're, you're really right, Dewi, that the, the question was about employability, becoming a good boss and so, and so forth. So in a way, it is about access to the labor market. But it's also very important to note that higher education or education of any kind is not just for uh, access to the labor market. It's not mm -hmm. just for employability, but higher education as well as other forms of education can have many different purposes. Thank you, Dr. Lim. I couldn't agree more with it. Okay, now let's move on to the second question. So it's coming from Mr. Narendra Arivisnu. So I just want to confirm, can you hear me clearly? 
Yes. Yes. Okay, that's perfect. Okay, the second question is, uh, uh, Mr. Nanetro saw that one of SDG's goal is a heavy free education by uh, 2030. So until what level is that uh, of free education itself for, uh, to the higher education or until what level and who will fund, who will give the funding for that? Uh, is that a question to myself or to, okay. Yes, so, it's still for Dr. Lim. <laughs> right. So you, you know, the SDGs, they are in a way like a, a dream of the, of the world. Like, you know, the, the idea is to eliminate poverty, to achieve, for example, in environment, environmental sustainability. So they are very big goals. And I think part of SDG4 is really the goal to provide precisely free access to higher education to those who want it and who are um, qualified for it. So it does include, in my understanding, higher education. Regarding the funding, well, that is also another question. So the, the SDGs don't say who should fund it. They just say that they should be provided. Obviously, the, the people who are coordinating these, um, these goals mean that policymakers need to, to make uh, decisions about how societies provide access. So it's access. The access should be free to higher education. So whether that's a combination of public and private support or funds uh, is a question that is being debated in different countries. So just to give an example, for example, from the Philippines. So the Philippines has introduced free higher education at the uh, yeah, at state universities and colleges, meaning public education is, is free, but that might not be the solution for other countries. So in the UK, the UK government provides a loan to anyone who wants to go to university. So the government <laughs> provides the loan, you can pay it over a long time, but uh, it's the individual who needs to repay the loan. So that is a different kind of system. And there are other systems across the world. But the idea is, yes, under SDG, or for those who would like it, the access to higher education should be free and equitable. OK, thank you, Dr. Lim, for the answer. OK, uh, let me move to the third question. So we have four questions for Dr. Lim here. So the third question is uh, coming from Ms. Sakila Nurifana. So she mentioned that in Indonesia, before entering a college, so we are tested first in the national examinations. So, and that will determine uh, whether or not we can accept it as the college student or not. So the same as if uh, you want to enter a junior high school or a senior high school as well. So she want to ask about, uh, it's like, do you think the standardized uh, national examinations or testing is the most effective way to judge the learning outcome of the students. So if it is not, do you have any other way uh, to know the learning outcome of each individual better? Thank you. <laughs> that is a really good question. Um, I, I recall a quote from one of the British politicians, um, uh, Winston Churchill, and he said that uh, democracy Democracy is the worst form of government uh, after you have tried um, all the others. So in, in other words, it's the worst, but the others are even more bad than democracy. <laughs> that, is, that was his idea. It's the worst system after you try all the others. And I think this, is, this can be also said about standardized testing. There are so many issues and concerns about standardized testing. And um, in principle, we should probably function in a world where we don't have standardized testing and each person, each learner is really evaluated according to a kind of personalized set of standards. But I just wonder, for instance, in a country like Indonesia or the Philippines, where decisions need to be made for a very, very large number of people, um, there are, there are real questions about how that can be achieved without some form of standardization. So I would say that it is a very bad way of, of <laughs> measuring learning outcomes. But the alternatives are also difficult. 
Yes, it's so really I, hard. Yeah. <laughs> yes, please. No, so I, I just wanted to say, I, I, I'm not sure I can answer that, um, that question. It's just to say that I know of a lot of researchers who are trying to make standardized testing better. In other words, to try and make the system better and to try and make it capture learning better. But I, I, that is not my specific field. And I know of a lot of colleagues who are trying to do good work in that area, but I don't believe that they will ever achieve a like, perfect um, system of assessment. Uh, but the problem is that other systems of assessment will also have their own um, their own problems. So, yeah, I don't have the answer, unfortunately, for for the for the question, except to say that it is a deeply imperfect system. But we are trying to make it work in a better way, and that's that's what we have at the moment. And it's the it's the kind of assessment system that can work at the scale required. Okay, Dr. Lee. <laughs> yeah, we know that it's a very hard to determine uh, whether uh, is that the best way to measure the learning outcome of the students or not. Uh, yeah, we still have no idea about it. Okay, we will move to the next questions, which is coming from uh, Mr. Muhammad Fikar. So he's asking, uh, what steps should be taken by the global main actors of a quality of education? So which is the United Nations uh, through some of its body like UNDP and UNICEF to reduce the inequality of education between students in rural and uh, urban areas. So especially in the times of uh, this pandemic COVID-19. There are a lot of there are a lot of indicators contained in the um, SDG goals. So if you go to the website or if you go to the databases that are meant to support the SDGs, there are a lot of indicators being collected that are meant to address inequalities of all kinds, many different kinds of inequalities, including the rural and urban divide. So I think by having that indicator, the idea is that more policymakers will pay attention to that divide. So if you can show with, for instance, these, these numbers, these statistics that the divide is very big, then people can, or policymakers, politicians, teachers can put more effort where, the, where that divide is greater. So that is at least the, the spirit of having those indicators. However, as we know, data is imperfect. Um, there are a lot of gaps in the data. In fact, from rural areas, that is exactly an area where um, it is harder to get data. It is harder to know um, what is the gap because you don't have data, for instance, about areas outside the big city. This is very clear in, for instance, some African um, countries. When you go to the data set, you will see a lot of gaps in those areas. So. Um, I mean, I can only say what they are trying to do. They are trying to put attention to the to the to that problem via um, these indicators. Uh, I know that technology has been proposed as a solution. This is a different um, conversation about those who are working in education technology to see if education technology can solve those problems. Some people say that they can. Some people say that it is not. It is not really enough. Some people say that it's not only a rural urban divide, there are also divides within the city. There are high performing and low performing areas as well in, in city centers. And they say that as urbanization increases, this is another in inequality or area of inequality that needs to be monitored. But again, I, um, I think that people are aware of this, of this problem. Um, it's in an area of education technology that, that I think some of my colleagues are better uh, position to answer than me, but I know that they try to do this by presenting the data that shows these inequalities. Okay, Dr. Lin, thank you very much for the great discussions about the yeah inequality, inequality in education. So for the time being, I would like to move uh, the questions to Dr. Arfan a bit. After that, we will come back again to Dr. Lim if there is a further questions. So Dr. Arfan, uh, there is a question from Ms. Nadine Natasha. She asked about, yeah. Anyway, uh, speaking about the online lectures, I feel that the task given feels a burden. 
because uh, they are almost all of the same types or sometimes they are all the same, just the same. So as the students, I would prefer if the assignment was to test my comprehension rather than solely on grades. So how do you think about that? What do you think the right amount and the types of tasks the student should be getting? So what kind of tasks that the student should be getting rather than uh, using the same way of uh, uh, testing? Dr. Arfan. Okay, thank you very much for the question. Let me try to respond. Okay, you mentioned the word tasks and tests. That's something extremely different. So mm -hmm. we giving tasks is allow the student to learn using the task. We, we call it task-based learning, okay? Test is something else. <laughs> Test is something else. So let me focus on the task, okay? Um, how many, how much, how deep is the task for the students? It really depends on the cognitive uh, background of the student and also the kind of courses or the content material whether it is introductory or advanced, whether uh, students in the first year, second year, whether the students are uh, working individually or a pair work or in a group work. Many criteria refers to the task. But then in online conditions, I suggest to the lectures and also for the students to to suggest the lectures, to have a task which combine the online and also offline activities. For example, we are working on uh, mostly ITSF engineering uh, students. Well, in a certain concept, we need to demonstrate uh, natural law, for example. How can we do this offline? Okay, so we just setting up a task with a lot of the students using simple tools to demonstrate their understanding or comprehension of this by doing, say, a small project of it rather than just testing. In Bahasa Indonesia, we diketahui, ditanyakan. Things like that. That's that's merely test, not a task. Okay. Well, I fully realize that Indonesian students are familiar with the test since elementary schools. There are a lot of tests they have to execute. But then, if they have some project in university level, they get confused. How can my lecturer know that I understand this concept? Okay, I don't answer any questions, but I just create something. So for some students, uh, they like to have a test and know exactly like quizzes, for example, eh? at once when you submit and you get the score at once. But some of the students like to explore something, to innovate, to, to you know, um, challenge their creativity, to, fix, to make something interesting. That's the way uh, we do. So uh, in this case, uh, the lecture as a student can negotiate. This is the right word. Can negotiate at, at the beginning. Sometimes a creative lecture will give, uh, you know, choices, whether you want to do this, you want to do A, B, or C. The weighting is the same. For example, 25%. You can do A, you can do B, you can do C with different, uh, you know, for example, you can write essay, you can make a video, or you take a test, for example. So the, the way to measure uh, their comprehension, the students' comprehension, I think uh, it should be negotiable. That should be negotiable. And uh, we can open at the beginning of the course with, uh, with the lecturer. So uh, you can initiate uh, whether we can negotiate uh, kind of tasks or tests. Thank you. 
<laughs> okay, thank you very much, Dr. Arfan. So it will be good if in the beginning of the lectures, we can make a deal with the lecture. So what kind of stars that we will have in the upcoming semester and also what kind of tests that they're getting to have so you can be prepared in the beginning of the semester. <laughs> Okay, Dr. Afan, the next question is coming from Ms. Shifa. Can you hear me clearly? Because I have a echo in my side, in my sight. It is clear here. Yeah, we can hear you clearly, Ms. Devi. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we can hear you clearly. Miss Devi, so it's you. coming from Miss Siva. Yes. She is asking uh, to read to bring more online or blend learning opportunities in higher education in Indonesia. So, uh, I have seen so many universities in the US and UK offering online degrees, and some new universities are popping up there don't even have any physical lecture halls. So I feel like uh, this is an incredible thing for the world of education, but don't see it much in Indonesia yet. So what areas do you think Indonesia like, sir? Thank you. Thank you very much for the questions. Okay, uh, which one is better? Which one is good? Online, blended, or offline? Things like that. In this case, we uh, assume blended is uh, the way the instructions carry out in terms of offline or online. But it really depends on the students. Yeah. I think the offer of online learning is not just the offer of uh, choices, but it depends on uh, the student or the learning itself. Online learning requires very high autonomous learning. So the children must be very autonomous. They know the pace, they are very disciplined, okay? They, uh, you know, they, are, they sh must be punctual in any time because at the beginning of the semester, they set up their goals. They fill in, once I joined the University of Kansas, uh, free lectures, uh, not free lecture, free course. But at the beginning, we, we should uh, fill in many forms. The activities that we have to choose weekly and the outcome of weekly tasks. So you set up the date, very rigid. And I'm not sure, well, it's not really pessimistic though, but then I'm not sure Indonesian children can do that because it's, uh, it's, it's, it's return on you. Because you set up your own pace of learning and you have to be responsible for that. Okay. So whether for Indonesian, I think we still have some blended learning. Sometimes, you know, Asian countries, Asian culture like to talk a lot. They like to chat, hang out, and so on. That's also true for learning. Remember, we, <laughs> I think uh, there is a survey said that the you know, the mood elevation is very uh, the burdens of this kind of learning. Why? Because uh, many Indonesian feels very stressful in this kind of things. Yeah, they cannot really, uh, uh, you know, come up with ideas while they have to stuck in their rooms all the time, every day. It seems that the world never ends. There's a lot of tasks they have to finish completed and with many deadlines so uh, when when you watch uh, the last video i uh, i play it's one of them say that it seems that life never ends it seems that i have to check my timeline my schedule all the time so that then i don't miss a single task that makes me uh, in trouble sometimes. So, okay. So in my, my opinion, this is my personal opinion, blended learning. Blended learning means 
say 30 40 percent online well 60 70 percent we do it offline with a uh, real classroom meeting and real project on the field thank you okay thank you based on a doctor our friend preference so he preferred to have a blended learning for indonesian students here okay so still we have uh, sometimes i would like to deliver one more questions to uh, dr lim here we have a questions for dr lim so it's coming from miss sarah so Recently, uh, there have been some talk surrounding uh, the accessibility of higher education and uh, how it's only reserved for the wealthy or the college uh, admission scandals. You can pay your way into getting into a good college, for example. So some even say uh, most, uh, most of the school system and a standardized test, uh, for example, the SAT test, also prefers to the wealthy persons because it costs money uh, to get the best tutor for the preparations, for example. So what is your stance uh, on that and how the SDGs will fix uh, this kind of problem, Dr. Lim? That's very good. And again, the, the idea is that um, I think the SDGs do a lot of good, but um, I, I encourage everyone and also the person who asked the question to really think about how apart from the SDG, how to really solve the wider problem of inequality beyond education. So education, mm -hmm. I think, cannot solve this problem on its own or as a sector. And as the person is showing through the question, education is perhaps contributing, the system of education is contributing to inequality because it is acting as a gatekeeper to the high paying um, profession. I recommend that the person ask the question, read, there are many, many different books, but one that came out very recently is Michael Sandel, The Tyranny of Merit. So uh, in this book, as well as in many other books, they talk about education, the field of education as a field that is giving the justification for inequality in society that because we are being tested and because the ones who get the higher grades are the ones who are able to go to the higher to the quote unquote better universities that they deserve um, more money but we know that uh, it takes money to be able to prepare for a good exam it takes money to have tutors to go to better school so that is there is a difficulty there so again um there is that book, The Tyranny of Merit by Michael Sandel. There is also work, uh, it's a very recent, I've forgotten the author, but um, the finding is that um, in countries that have a more communitarian approach to higher education, so in, in the US where the book of Michael Sandel is, um, you know, that's the context of Michael Sandel's book. He works out of Harvard University. But another researcher who is working for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, another American foundation, they're working as well with this uh, SDG goals. They found out that in some countries, in some systems, the belief of the teachers is that no child should be left behind, to use this term. Um, rather than, oh, the strongest children will succeed. But if the belief of the whole society is more communitarian, and they found this in some countries, not in all countries. So again, there are differences in the society, not just in the education system, but in the wider society. So they noticed that in countries like America or the, or the UK, where the belief is that if you work hard and if you deserve it because of your merit, then people say, well, this, these students, they don't get good grades, so they deserve, they deserve to be paid less. They don't deserve to go to, the go to the good schools or the good universities. The ones who are there, they deserve to be there. Um, but as, I guess the idea of SDG4 is that everyone deserves a quality education. So it's not that, oh, some people deserve it and some people don't, but that it's the responsibility of the whole society to make sure that everyone gets a good education. And there are some societies that work a little bit more in that, with that philosophy. There are, of course, advantages and disadvantages, but that's hopefully an answer to the question. 
Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Dr. Lim, for the answer. So actually, we are run out of the time, but I believe this is uh, there will be the last questions for uh, Dr. Arfan and Dr. Lim. So the question is coming from Adeline from uh, Philippines. So she is asking about uh, because of the pandemic, the college students access their education through online learning. So do you think this may have an effect on how the employers or the people in the general will view our degree when uh, we are graduating? Maybe I'll leave Dr. Arfan to answer that question. Okay. Because he focused <laughs> more on this, on this area. Yeah, thank you for the questions. Hello, Philippines. Uh, thank you for joining this session. Okay, um, I think uh, this pandemic happens across countries around the world. Um, we cannot avoid that uh, every every students in tertiary education happens this kind of uh, uh, learning process and also learning game. Some excuses might uh, be raised because of this. Uh, but then uh, I think uh, in viewing the quality of education, especially uh, the outcome of uh, university graduates, I think um, most of the employer will see uh, the same thing. Yeah. Uh, maybe they need more training uh, to have, uh, to get into the starting point of uh, the job. But uh, in my understanding, they uh, realize that uh, this situation wouldn't be better. So um, instead of uh, questioning whether, um, the employers see the quality of uh, education uh, during the pandemic. My answer is yes, of course, but then it happens around the world. So you never worry about, uh, I got two semesters online while well, my friends, my, my senior have four years offline, for example. Do they have better quality? I think there is no research still work, uh, uh, result of this, but then uh, do not to worry about that kind of thing. Yeah. So um, being able to learn in that kind of situation is priceless. This is my, so never give up on this situation. Thank you. Okay, so no need to worry for these uh, situations. <laughs> Okay, thank you. And uh, how about Dr. Lim? Do you have any other insight? I, I think perhaps uh, most employers will recognize from their own operations. Uh, you know, companies are learning to work online. They're learning what the advantages and disadvantages are. So I think they will be able to apply this to understanding how universities work. I think many universities... Uh, educational institutions have done a lot of work to really provide, um, you know, like uh, education. So obviously it's not entirely the same, but it doesn't mean that it is also worse. I think that is something important to, to, to emphasize that it's a different learning experience, but it's not the, necessarily a worse learning experience. And I think more and more people are seeing precisely the differences as well as the, the things that can be done um, online. So that will hopefully affect as well their appreciation of degrees that have been delivered under these circumstances. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Lim, for your insight. So everyone, so actually we are already in the end of the session. So I really thanks uh, to all the participants who actively uh, asked the questions and also to our great speaker, uh, Dr. Lim and uh, Dr. Arfan. Thank you very much for your valuable time during this session. So on behalf of the uh, organizing committee, I'd like to uh, uh, thank you very much uh, once again. And if you have any mistake, uh, we are, we are very sorry for that. Okay, so for now, I will pass back uh, the virtual microphone to the Master of Ceremony. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Dr. Lim and Dr. Arfan for the excellent lecture today. And thank you as well to Ms. Dewi for moderating this insightful session. Please give applause to our speakers and moderator by using the Zoom reaction feature. Furthermore, we would like to present a certificate award to both, to both speakers and also our moderator today. This is a certificate presented for Dr. Miguel Antonio Lim. And next, this is the certificate presented for Dr. Arfan Fahmi. And this is the certificate presented for Ms. Dewi Sakti Ardiantuno. Once again, thank you very much to Dr. Liam and Dr. Arfan and Ms. Dewi for your availability on today's guest lecture series. Okay, before we end our lecture today, we invite you all, all participants, as well as the honorable speakers and moderator to take a group photo. To all participants, please open your camera. And maybe the committee can help me take the photo. Uh, as we have uh, six slides. Okay, let's start from the first slide and I will count one, two, three. All right, moving on to the second slide. One, two, three. And the third slide, one, two, three. And the fourth slide, one, two, three. And the fifth slide, one, two, three. And the last slide, one, two, three. Okay. Now, we finished the group photo. Then for the participants, please fill the feedback form through the link bit.ly slash feedback GLS that you can also see on this Zoom chat room. The deadline for filling the feedback form is one hour after we finish this session. We want to remind you the participants who will get the stamp is participants who come on time, join this event until the end and also fill the feedback form. Finally, we have reached the end of today's guest lecture series and we sincerely apologize for any mistakes we have made in presenting as Master of Ceremony and Committee. Thank you very much to Dr. Lim and Dr. Tarfan and Ms. Dewi and to all participants for the attention and co cooperation. Tomorrow, we will have two parallel guest lectures. The first one will be presented by Dr. Pramila Tamunaidu from University of Technology Malaysia and Dr. Warma Dewanti from Research Center of Infrastructure and Sustainable Environment ITS. The topic will be related to SDGs number 12, Responsible Consumption and Production. Then the second one, there are Associate Professor Ferry G from Edith Cohen University and Dr. Ninit Indah Arvid Rida from Research Center of Manufacturing, Transportation and Logistics ITS as our speakers. The topic will be related to SDGs number nine, industry, innovation, and infrastructure. I, Asia, as MC, bids farewell. Good afternoon, and we will see you again tomorrow at GLS. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you once again to Dr. Miguel Antonio Lin and Dr. Arman Fahmi and also uh, Miss Dewi Satya for the uh, amazing uh, sharing for today. And uh, let me uh, end this session uh, in three, two, one. Uh, thank you, everyone, and see you tomorrow.